We want to create an abundance of labor. So I just think the quickest way to get there is to go through these consumer domestic use cases because it will give you the most intelligent system and it will give you the largest fleet size. Which very disruptive products started in enterprise? It's very rare. Everything starts in consumer and then it tickles down into enterprise. Today, we'll be interviewing the CEO of One X, one of the leading AI robotic companies producing androids capable of human-like movements and behaviors. With a partnership and funding from OpenAI, this US-Norwegian company had the world's first commercially deployed humanoid robot patrolling large premises for top US space and aerospace clients. Starting first with their wheeled robots called EVE, they've now unveiled their next generation bipedal humanoid NEO, which will start full-scale production next year. They've shown massive breakthroughs in AI, teaching their EVE robots general purpose skills capable of many all autonomous tasks. And with NEO, the bots will soon be able to do any tasks using just voice commands and natural language. Today, we'll meet with Bert Bornich, the co-founder and CEO. Welcome, Bernd. Thank you for joining me. Great to be here, Herbert. Thanks for having me on the pod. Love it. This is you're, you're one of our favorite robotics companies. There's a lot that we're going to talk about today that few know about that they really need to know about. Also, we should mention that in the second half of this interview, we'll be joined by John Gibbs, who's an AI professor. One of the things that struck me about your company is that you've been here early, but you've already struck the partnership with OpenAI much earlier than others, and you have commercial application. You actually have tens and even up to a hundred bots in order for your bots commercially doing security applications, a partnership with ADT, uh, which is now called Everon, correct? So tell me about, um, tell me about that. Sure. So I guess st starting with the commercial part of this. So go back to, actually I have to go all the way back to 2021. Then we worked very deeply together with ADT to pilot these uh, EVE androids into security. And this was very successful. So we, we rolled this out with three of the bigger US companies in space and aerospace and had the droids with them for months. Uh, at this point, we were operating them and we were training the AIs and we were running the system. And based on this success, we managed to structure a partnership with ADT, where they also ordered 140 droids to be deployed over the years into security. And we started delivering on this in the middle of 2023. So we actually have EVE Androids now operating in security for some big aerospace companies where the customer is fully engaged and they are the ones operating the droids and the droids are doing their security during nor normal uh, operating hours. So it was, it was a journey where we learned an enormous amount as a company because no matter how much we test in the lab and we did a lot of testing, once you actually deploy this, you learn so much. And once you actually have to leave and leave your customer with your product and go home, you learn even more. And this is something that we really look forward to leveraging now as we start scaling our manufacturing of NEO and rolling out the new droids is all of this backend infrastructure, the boring backend infrastructure that we had to build out to be able to deploy robots at scale and to know that they're healthy, to aggregate all the data so we can train across the entire fleet and all of these things. Okay, well, I mean, that it just blows me away that you're already doing commercial work. Your bots are actually physically there, not pilots. This is actually there. And you talked about 130 uh, on order and many already physically there. That is uh, pretty amazing. Yeah, and I think also to, to build on that, if you... So these first deployments, they, they're very different, right? So I want to emphasize this because it's so much harder and we worked a lot to get there. Um, most of what we do is on our customers' R&D budget. So for example, if you look at logistics, we are operating tens of droids in logistics currently as pilots for some big customers in warehouses. And 
this is great because we learn so much, the customer learns so much, but this is running off their R&D budget. And taking the step from being an R&D partner to actually being a provider of a service where a customer pays for useful work done by the droids, th that's really been the big, big milestone that we uh, are very proud of hitting in 2023. Yeah, it's very hard to do useful work, which means, um, you know, the bot needs to be, you know, cost effective which is hard to do when you just started this. It has to move as fast as a human or, or fast enough that they find that it's valuable, replacing, you know, charging, all of that. So anyway, one of the things about your company that I, again, just this one is a big one, commercial uh, useful work, but the other one is your partnership with OpenAI. So early on, uh, you and Sam Altman were talking already and they invested in your company. They partnered with your company very early on. I want to play a short clip here of Sam talking about uh, you guys and why they decided to invest in this and then we'll get you to react to it. Investing a little bit in robotics companies, I think on the physical hardware side, there's finally for the first time that I've ever seen really exciting new platforms being built there. and. At some point, we will be able to use our models, as you were saying, with their language understanding and future video understanding to say, all right, like, let's do amazing things with a with a robot. In a recent interview with Bill Gates, Sam Altman mentioned that we, meaning OpenAI, were starting to invest in robotic companies. That interview coincided with this article from VentureBeat. 1X, a robotic startup backed by OpenAI, receives 100 million in funding. Now, 1X has made headlines before with its EVE robot. The wheeled enterprise-centric robot has already been deployed with multiple organizations for industrial tasks such as moving equipment, opening doors, fulfilling orders, etc. But OpenAI's investment allowed the 1X company to create the next big thing. Norway, March 23, 2023. 1X, previously named Lottie Robotics, a manufacturer and inventor of Androids, announced today the successful close of its Series A2 funding round, raising $23.5 million. This round was led by the OpenAI Startup Fund, with participation from Tiger Global, a big investment player in the tech space, and a consortium of Norway-based investors. 1X is at the forefront of augmenting labor through the use of safe, advanced technologies in robotics said Brad Lightcap, Chief Operations Officer and Manager of the OpenAI Startup Fund. Okay, so uh, you you and Sam were talking very early on. Um, <laughs> tell me about that relationship and, you know, they chose you as one of the first partners. Tell us about that. Yeah, so it's pretty interesting, right? Because we're, we're back in summer 2021. So this was before ChatGPT, and two things really to Sam's credit, right? He, he very early understood two things. He understood that the AI here is going to work. And of course he knew a lot of what would be happening based on his knowledge of how open AI models were performing. And then the other subtle thing that I want to talk a bit more about that he really immediately got was the way we design our droids is very different from the rest of the human or robotics companies. So if I'm going to say like what I'm the most proud of with Neo, mm -hmm. it's not actually the specifications. Like I'm very proud of this. It's that, that also is like, it's, it's a full humanoid just weighs 66 pounds, can lift 154. It can run, but it's actually that it's not an industrial machine. It's more kind of like a Baymax. It's very lightweight. It's very low energy. It's soft, it's compliant, and it's safe among people. So basically he took a look at this, pushed it a bit around and like how this system is so safe, adaptable and compliant. And basically just said, no, no, you don't need to explain it. I get it. And it's this combination, right, of having something that's safe so that you can get it out into the world, do useful labor among people and actually learn among us. 
because most of our knowledge comes from this enormous amount of diverse tasks that we do in everyday life. It doesn't really come from inside a, a cage in a factory floor. And that was, the, I guess, the beginning of a very interesting journey that takes us to where we are today. And we're, we're still a very uh, strong partnership with them, and we are doing things to develop next generation AIs together, figuring out how to package this as a product, um, which is very interesting because there's a lot of unsolved problems, especially on the UX side. And what I mean by UX here is how do you integrate a large visual language model with an embodiment in a manner that actually turns into a good product experience for an end customer. So a lot of exciting work to do there. So they do the large language model and the visual language model, but do you have your own AI division? Who's, what other partners do you have? Do you have a, you know, other groups that you're, uh, some people have partnered with NVIDIA. Do you feel like you're going to take it with just open AI or who else have you partnered with? So we're actually a very, very vertically integrated company. So if you think even start with the hardware, uh, we don't actually buy any components. We, we even make our own coils for our own designed motors, our own magnet arrays, all of the manufacturing equipment that goes into making this, all of the big automation systems that are needed to make these parts, they are made in-house uh, for our own line. And this goes all the way up through like electronics, sensors, firmware, but also the AI stack. So you can say like, we train the models that are able to figure out how the physical world works and do useful labor and interact with the world in a seamless manner. And this model does this incredibly well for basically almost any task. And this can include social interactions and other things that you would typically say might be better done with a VLM but needs to be done kind of from the robot side. And then on top of that, we have the VLM from OpenAI, which enables us to do very, very long-term horizon planning. So for example, I want you to guard this facility. And after 5 PM, Herbert and Bernd are the only two who are allowed to be here. And you <laughs> better make sure all the windows are closed and tell me if any doors are unlocked. Wow. And then based on that, you can kind of stream these predictions on like, what are the next things you should do? And then our model is able to do that. So we're, we're also, we, we have our own pretty big internal AI team. And at this point, we are training pretty large models to enable us to do the things that you might've seen in some of our videos. And uh, we're super excited to continue doing this. And also very excited to figure out how to integrate the next generation, more multimodal models, right? That comes on top of this for the long-term uh, planning. Yeah, you you have dropped quite a number of videos, and you've every time you say this has all been done in one X speed, it's all autonomous, a lot of variety of tasks. One of the things you guys have done that uh, a few others have done is whenever you show a video, it's not usually just one. <laughs> Sometimes you'll show tens or twenty of these bots. So I will want to ask you about manufacturing, uh, but before we get there, so tell me about your training. Um, you had mentioned to me privately earlier that some of these, uh, the, your commercial partners can actually train them on their own now. And so how does that, how does that work? Is it through simulation? Is it through uh, teleoperation? Is it just the videos, you know, bots are looking for videos? What are they doing? So th there's many ways you could do this, but mostly what we do, uh, especially with customers is we've built out some very nice user-friendly tools for how to gather data, typically done through teleoperation, where you do the tasks as if you were there. This is one of the big advantages with humanoids, right? That I know you've talked about on the pod before. You want your embodiment to be as close to the human as possible, both kinematically and dynamically, because this allows you to very easily teach someone how to do the tasks with the system. And even more importantly, it allows you to ensure that whoever is doing the tasks are doing them in a manner that is close to optimal for the robot. And then based on this, once you gather the data and label the data, because into this goes not only the actions. I, I like to think about it like we are at scale cloning human thought 
and human action. So you also want the thoughts behind why you did the decisions you decided to do. So like I'm picking up the cup and putting it on the cupboard here because I want to carry all the cups to the kitchen more efficiently at one time. Picking up the next cup, I'm putting it on the cupboard. So this data gets then automatically massaged and featureized so that you can now train a model based on this pretty fast locally. Here we're using some modern, uh, quite well-known techniques now for doing fast um, fine-tuning of models and then ensuring that you actually manage to do the task in a manner that makes the robot succeed on this task. And now, given that that works well, you add it to the next checkpoint for the foundation model and you've added a skill. And uh, this works incredibly well and it's very scalable. Uh, and this also brings us into how we do our AI strategy, which we maybe should have talked about a bit before this. Mm -hmm. So for our system, the entire system is completely end-to-end. -end. And what I mean by this is that there is actually no module that is trained on how to grasp things. There's no computer vision module that is trained on how to recognize objects or segment the world into a 3D version of the world. It is the images that the robot sees plus its own proprioception. So basically what is its velocities, positions, etc. It's the tactile, everything else that goes into this, the forces that the robot senses. All of this goes into a big transformer and out comes the actions that the robot is doing. So this means you need no experts to be able to massage any of these networks. It's just data in actions out. And this generalizes extremely well once you get to scale and given that you know how to draw correctly from your distribution. So to make take a good example again, if you're packing shoes in a warehouse, once you've packed shoes a hundred times, you're probably not going to get that more, much more information from doing that task. So you would like that to be a very even distribution of the tasks in your uh, data set and very high quality, of course, of the data. Okay. So it sounds like, which oh, something, a common theme that I've been hearing is that the, the AI part of it, the intelligence part of it, and it, just for the fact of being able to do useful work is something that you, it sounds like from the way you're talking about, it's a, it's a, for certain tasks, you've already been able to do this. You have commercial robots doing useful work today. One is, you know, security, but you've also shown a lot of pick and plays and you're saying that you can teach it autonomously to do things autonomously fairly easily. So is this again, what I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is this a solved problem that you you can definitely be able to do many different tasks in the future. So I want to separate between two different things here, which is quite important, but a bit technical. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we can solve al almost any task with few shot learning. And what I mean by that is that if you give the robot 10 demonstrations of a task, it can most likely do the task. We have some first signs of life, which as far as I know, is actually mm -hmm. a first in zero shot generalization where the robot zero can shot. Do, yeah. Zero shot. Yeah. Where, yeah. Where a robot can do a task it has never seen before. Yeah. But this is not very reliable, right? It's like a 10% success rate, mm. but it's finally there. Right. And this, you also saw very early in like, as you started scaling the GPT models for language models that at some point you actually start to see these emergent zero shot, more common sense, let's call it common sense type behaviors. So we can automate tasks that are kind of like in the dull, dirty, dangerous, uh, part of it where, where it's the same task over and over in a very similar environment that already works very well. If you want to automate something that is quite diverse, like let's say tidy a house. Mm -hmm. Now you actually need common sense because you need to, you are going to make mistakes. It's too long of a horizon of tasks. So you will make mistakes. So now you need to actually know how to recover when you make mistakes. You need to know that you made a mistake. And this kind of common sense reasoning 
we do not have reliable solutions to yet. But we're starting to see the signs of life of this. So that's going to be the big thing for us now in 2024, is being going to be like really scaling our data collection, increasing the size of our models, increasing the amount we spend on compute, and really seeing how much we can push the boundaries of these uh, very promising scaling laws that we currently see as we scale this. There's still a lot of work to be done. No, okay. no, no, no doubt there's a lot of work to be done, but I have to reword a lot of my questions because you already have commercial application, you're able to do tasks, uh, useful work, you're able to train them to do autonomously useful work. And then what you're doing is describing to me like the even like the future planning to be able to tidy a house, a very generic thing. Uh, your partnership with OpenAI allows you to speak to it, to be able to it, it to understand the world a little bit better. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're going to get back to this because uh, John Gibbs will come in and ask you more questions. But let's get to manufacturing because you have hundreds of bots. You have the Eve robot, which is wheeled. So that's very useful for certain work like security. Then you have the bipedal robot. So how many of these bots have you made of each? And what is your plans for manufacturing? So, yeah, so, so we don't give out exact numbers, but I can say that we are coming up on our 100 droid pretty soon. Wow. In total, yeah. over the two versions. Um, and we have a significant amount of them in daily operation, um, gathering data. And uh, this has been incredibly exciting because most of the things that we now see working on the AI side did not work when we had 10 droids because we did, just did not have enough data. So as most things in learning here, it is back to like, it's diversity first, your data needs to be relevant, there needs to be information in it that you can learn, there needs to be high quality, and then lastly, it needs to have quantity. And there, there really is no large data sets really in robotics yet, right? So I think we have might have the largest robotics data set on the planet. And uh, it's going to get exponentially larger as we go. And I think a lot of the problems that we've seen in robotics might be more related to the lack of data, actually, than the complexity. So you have this well-known uh, Moravex paradox that like we evolved language a lot later and higher level reasoning biology-wise a lot later then we actually evolved our ability to manipulate. And that our ability to manipulate the world is so mature and it's so complex. And this is true, it is incredibly complex. But that like there will be a long, long, long time between solving reasoning and language before you solve any kind of physical interaction and manipulation. And I used to believe this very firmly, but I'm not so sure I believe it anymore. Because we're, we're really seeing that if you have the data, you can very efficiently learn this. But what we're also seeing is that simulation is very far from reality. Okay. So if we want to learn something in simulation, we usually need millions of samples that we can learn with hundreds of samples in the real world. So while simulation is very useful, mm -hmm. it gets computationally extremely inefficient once you want to start to actually scale your models to large sizes, because you're, you, you just need to train on so many more samples of data, because it doesn't really correlate that well to the real world. Okay, yeah, because nine humanoid robot companies partner with NVIDIA, and they've got the simulation lab to be able to do this. Um, I love that you're saying that, in fact, you think that real world and volume of robots will give you richer information. You've got a hundred plus robots already made. What's your plans for manufacturing? Are you already thinking that? Are you in 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 is Eve a product you can continue building? Or are you switching a hundred percent to Neo? And then are you ready? Are they design locked that you're ready to go and do a mass manufacturing? And who's your partner to build? Sure. So first of all, we, we, we do manufacture all this ourselves. So there's no partner on the build side. Okay. Um when I started the company, it's nine years ago now. All the way from day one, it's really been a manufacturing first type of company. 
And given that this pod also merged to Tesla, you can say like it's very similar to the Tesla approach in that sense. Mm -hmm. So it's incredibly hard once you've designed your product to go back and say, oh, now we're going to make it manufacturable because you've completely locked in all of your design decisions at that point. So actually, this the reason for going in the more bio-inspired path for how we design our droids was a combination of manufacturability and safety. Those are the two big things. So you need to really think about this from day one. So how we design our motors, how we design our tendon drives for the joints, all of these things are very much from first principles and made of very affordable material and in a manner that allows us to automate the production of all of this. So we are fully vertically integrated in the sense that not only do we make our own copper coils for our motors and our own uh, magnet arrays for the motors that we've designed, but we even make the pretty large machines that produce these copper coils and produce all of these parts automatically for our assembly line. And this, I think, is very much an essential component to get to scale. Because manufacturing cost is, is ultimately going to be what limits your ability to scale. So, so many people these days talk about like the first one to get a thousand robots out there to actually learn in the real world. And I think we have a pretty good shot at doing that. Mm. Now, if you're going to do that with an expensive system, that very, very quickly becomes insurmountable. If you're going to do that with a system that is very cost effective, it's actually not that much of a stretch that you can just do it because it, it's not really that expensive. And this is very much in contrast with if you think about most approaches, which is to take the legacy of the industrial robots from factories and turn this into a humanoid form factor and then work on the AI side, which is not necessarily a bad path to go down, but it's not going to get you to very scalable, cost-efficient Androids that you can, for example, deploy into domestic in a safe manner so you can learn among people and really get that diversity of data. That really requires you to take a completely different approach to how do you actually build a robot so that it's soft, low energy, and scalable with respect to manufacturing. So in summary, I'd say like we, we make the copper coils, the magnets, the stamping machines, the the electronics, the sensors, all the firmware and software, the AI stack, the camera solutions, all, all, of, all of this is uh, made in-house. Yeah. So are you going to manufacture a thousand robots, you think, by next year, by this year? So 2025 is the year where we will start to see these kinds of volumes. Okay. So while Eve has been a great platform for us to really learn so much about mm -hmm. scaling laws in AI, customer deployments, how to learn to be a product company, which is a big one going from being like an R&D research company to actually being a product company. Uh, it, it is not designed for manufacturing at scale. Mm -hmm. It's still pretty affordable okay. and it's a good robot and it's extremely reliable, but mm -hmm. these kind of volumes are targeted for Neo, the next generation. Gotcha. Okay. Makes sense. And then uh, Elon Musk recently said that the cost of Teslabot, he thinks, will be uh, at the minimum, it'll be le less than half the cost of a car. And then uh, th that's likely around $25,000. What's your target? So our target is significantly below that. Um, and a lot of people have doubted Elon and regretted it later. So I'll <laughs> help Elon on getting to 25K. Yeah. But I'll say it like this. With the current way they're building Tesla Bot, mm. they will not get to 25K due to the components 
that are used and the type of components and how, how that ties into specific needs for specific alloys for like very tight tolerances, these kind of things, but they're iterating very quickly. And I think, uh, from everyone in the competitive competitive space here, Tesla is probably the one that has the finger most on manufacturing. So that they, they'll get there, they'll get there. But I do think we currently have an edge because we thought about this, uh, from the beginning. Yeah. And I, it's, you, I'm sure it's, well, you, you tell me, but, uh, um, do you think that there's room for many different humanoid robot vendors who will survive, who might not survive? I think it's very hard to predict. So let's, let's talk a bit first then about approaches to the market, right? Mm. Because we've done our pilots and even our commercial deployments into security where manipulation, for example, does play a key component because a robot needs to be able to open doors to get around the building, ride the elevator, do these kind of things. And then a bit into logistics. And now we are going to go more directly towards domestic. That's, that's one of the big things we're doing with Neo. We're going to see if we can actually create, basically it, it is close to Rosie the robot, right? Yeah. Rosie this the robot. Hel this helper that <laughs> it's a, it's, it's, it's all of our dream, right? When, when, when we grow up and we think about robotics, I think it has great applications in elderly care. It's, it can really free up the human resources so that we can spend our time on things that we want to enjoy with our family and everything else. And also it's a good way to learn because now you have your droids among people, so it can learn all of the skills that we have as, uh, as humanity. And if this succeeds, I think it's very hard to catch up because at this point you have a system that is so capable and so intelligent. And has this pro properties we talk about with like common sense and uh, ability to correctly do social interactions and all of these things with a very unique data set that is very hard to get a hold of because you need thousands of robots out there to get it, uh, to get your AI to work. So in that case, it might be hard, but of course, once the market is big enough and diverse enough there will be more than one player. Now then there's the other version of this where you get different kinds of wedges. So you would say, okay, this company is really good at serving manufacturing. This yeah. company is very good at serving logistics. And that might also happen. It's hard to predict, but ultimately what I actually think it comes down to is cost. So if you think about the EV space, that's a good one. And if your car costs 25% more than your competitor, that might be okay. You can create like your own niche where people want that product and they'll, they'll pay a premium. If your product costs five times more than your competitor, you're out of business. That doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's maybe something that's not talked enough about in the space right now. Um, I, I've been in the space for a long time and my, my favorite example is actually Honda Asimo. And you, you have to go back close to 25 years yeah. Yeah, I remember. and we have Honda Asimo running around, walking upstairs, handing someone a ball. So being able to create a humanoid robot with impressive performance is actually not new given that you have infinite money. Being able to do it in a manner which is safe around people and scalable with respect to manufacturing, that is really what is going to enable you to leverage these new capabilities that we now have on the AI side, which you didn't have back in the 90s. But the hardware is still incredibly important because it needs to be safe and it needs to be scalable. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So you, this is your advantage. Uh, you've been in for a long time. You focused on, uh, manufacturability. You're doing it for safe cobot being able to work closely with humans. And then what you just said, there sounds like you're going to focus more in the domestic, the home 
and it needs to have this generalized knowledge, this common sense. And maybe if you can produce more of them out there, get them in the home, which again, I've not heard any of the other human or robot companies saying that that's where they're going to start with. You're going to go there and then we'll see how this works out. Is that correct? Is that the thinking? Yeah, I think yeah. it's, and, and this will do multiple things, right? We already talked about the AI and the diversity. The other part is the consumer adoption curve is so fast. So you yeah. can get to volumes very, very fast. And then tickle down how it happens into industries. So clearly this is what we're trying to solve here is labor in general, right? We want to create an abundance of labor. So I just think the quickest way to get there is to go through these consumer domestic use cases. Wow. Because it will give you the most intelligent system and it will give you the largest fleet size. And gotcha. you see this trend for actually most very disruptive products. It's almost like a scary exercise. Start thinking about like which very disruptive products started in enterprise. Mm. It's very rare. Everything starts in consumer and then it tickles down into enterprise. And then from there on, it kind of like catches on fire and like people use it very widely in enterprise and there could be a lot of money in that. So it can be a better margin on your products. But you start in consumer if it's very disruptive. If we're very contrarian. I love it. I'm going to add John Gibbs to the stage here with us. Uh, John is an AI professor in AI. He's a... Uh, I've co-founded a company with me called Human Bots, along with Scott Walter and Cern Basher. And he's got his own YouTube channel called Dr. Know-It-All. Welcome, John. Thanks. You uh, burnt, you you actually burned out my pen. I took so many notes, my pen is out of ink. So <laughs> <laughs> that's your fault. It's all your fault. So I, I've been completely blown away by what you've been talking about. I think Herbert, too. You could hear both of or You couldn't hear me. But I was in the background just shaking my head going like, I can't believe he's actually saying that they're going to do all this stuff because it does sound like you're being somewhat contrarian uh, to the general gist of humanoid bots, which is lovely. I, I, as a consumer, I actually kind of love that idea because I was thinking, man, I'll never see a robot in my house for 20 years. You know, it'll all, all be in the factory. So I would love to have one at home. I want to start with a question. I'm going to dial it back to towards the beginning of when you guys were talking and you said that you have, you were in conversations and and um, began a relationship with OpenAI in 2021, and that you and Sam Altman specifically talked about embodied AI. I am a, a huge proponent that artificial general intelligence, at least from a, an agentic point of view, it's going to necessitate having a body. That that these these things that live in a box that are just in lar large language models just have no chance at, at, at AGI at the same velocity that embodied AI does because of the amount of data that reality gives us over the amount of data that language gives us. So I don't know if you wanna talk a little bit more about that or if you wanna talk about your conversation with Sam back in 2021. It sounds like it sounds like both of you were thinking very much that way, you know, possibly three years ago, two and a half, three years ago. So uh, let me just start with like, I think Elia says this really well, right? So like, if you're gonna do robotics, you have to be a robotics company. Right. Like hardware is hard and there's manufacturing, there's everything. like you have to be all in on robotics. It's very hard for OpenAI to do that the way they were set up. Now, back to like, do you need embodiment? Mm -hmm. I don't think I can prove that you do, but as an engineer, it feels absurdly inefficient to not have it. So if you think about like what is observable in a video, for example, right. physics is not necessarily directly observable in a video. You can't infer, for example, how hard a contact is if you hit something. But of course, given infinite amounts of video, you might need to somehow on a higher level infer this, but it's incredibly inefficient. We see this right. on the language models too, right? Like original language models also had a certain amount of world model. And once you add images, it gets a lot better. Like you would rather describe colors with a picture than to try to describe it with text. It works to describe it with text, but it's incredibly inefficient. And this is also true for the embodiment. And I think these things are starting to get pretty well proven out. So there's not that much debate about that part of it. 
So here comes the spicy part. <laughs> I think we have at this point exhausted RLHF. So like the the thought of like saying we're going to present some data labeler with two examples of something and say which one is better, and then based on that create a reward function so we can continue to train our algorithm based on this, is starting to see its limits. And what you actually need here is you need grounding. You need facts. And that is what the real world is. It is the ability to check whether your facts hold. You have to run hypotheses. And you need to be able to do experiments. And I think this is going to be an incredibly exciting future where I hope that a few years from now, every hour where your Neo at home doesn't have anything to do, it'll be doing experiments cool. to increase its intelligence. Okay. So, because so not you, all, you want to run reinforcement learning. Right. That's the final goal. Right. But if you want but, to run reinforcement learning and simulation is not accurate enough, right. you need to run reinforcement learning in the real world. Okay. So, uh, okay, this this really ties into several things that I, I actually just very recently did a video on full self-driving, Tesla's full self-driving, and said that there is no way that they're going to become 10x better than the best human driver without getting rid of human drivers. Right now, they're just using RLHF. Basically, they're using human drivers as the ground truth. Mm -hmm. and And there's no, you can only get as good as the best human drivers that way. So in order to exceed human driving capability, it's going to have to do its own reinforcement learning. My theory was you could do that in simulation, but what you just talked about today was it might take a million simulated runs of some task to do, to learn something for the bot to learn something. Whereas in reality, you could do it in a hundred tasks or something along those lines. So several orders of magnitude, fewer shots that you have to teach something. Uh, like how <laughs> I know this doesn't have anything to do with one X because you're a humanoid robot company, but I'm going to get back to the safety and everything. But how would you conceive if you were in charge of Tesla's full self driving right now, how would you do reinforcement learning because it's a car, you know, it's inherently a dangerous object. It's moving a hundred kilometers an hour or something, you know, <laughs> it's a very unsafe thing to yeah, do. So now now you get back to like, <laughs> there has been many mornings where I have woken up and thought, why didn't I just build an app? <laughs> because robots are very hard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but there has not been any mornings yet where I woke up and said, why didn't I build, build an autonomous car company? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, this problem is so hard. Levels uh, of difficulty. And it gets back to what I said initially, mm -hmm. right? Sorry, I'm going to get back to not try to dodge your question, but like no, that's safety great. is an intricate part of your product from day one, right? So like, like I said, the Neo only weighs 66 pounds. Yeah, and that's wow. 66 pounds, not kilos. Pounds? 66 pounds, 30 kilos. Wow. 30 wow. kilos. So if we do it wow. in uh, metrics, it's easier for me too. So 30 kilos. No, metric is way easier for me too. So I was, that's why I was. I was and like, it's okay. actually soft, like us, right? Right. So it's, right. It's, it's actually soft, like able to collapse in on the tendons on the inside, take off any oh. impacts. Okay. And because and, and we even, have these, even harder areas like, like uh, joints yeah, and things like that. There's no hard external surfaces. Okay. I, yeah. Then, well, actually, can we take a moment and tangent to that? Because I, you know, from the first that I saw 1x, the first video I saw of Eve doing something, I was like, well, that just looks like a toy. And then I realized because it, it looks like a little stuffed animal. I mean, like you said, Baymax might have been one of your kind of inspirations, but it didn't look like a real robot because a real robot should look like a Terminator and be all hard chrome steel. And yeah, I mean, there we go, right? It, it didn't, it, I think it it, it uh, subverted our expectations of what a robot should look like. But this is something where I could see having that in the house. I'm not going to be scared to bump into it. Whereas something more like, you know, hard edged and everything, I would be terrified to bump into it because I might get injured. So, so yeah. yeah, so why, it's, it's how, how subtle, did you right? come up with that idea? Yeah. You know, it, it's even more subtle. It actually started in the other end. Okay. And this is a bit hard to explain, but when a robot moves, I'm going to try to visualize this. So when a robot moves, right? Mm -hmm. Say human speed, we can be pretty fast. Mm -hmm. Inside my elbow, there's a motor rotating. Now, if you have a gearbox here, like you have in most robots. So let's say you have a hundred to one. So mm -hmm. 
the motor inside here spins a hundred times faster than my arm moves. Right. Now, kinetic energy is actually the squared of the velocity. So that's why a car is way more dangerous in 80 miles per hour than 40. It's not twice as dangerous, it's four times as dangerous. This is the same for robotics. And there's this very interesting experiment you can do because you can actually take this rotational inertia and you can compute it out to an equivalent weight or mass. Right. And then for most of these robots, you'll see that it's roughly the equivalent of holding a 15 kilogram kettlebell in each hand and a 25 kilogram kettlebell strapped to each foot. And now you can go about your daily activities of living. And I, I recommend doing this experiment because for the first right. thing you will notice that, that you will actually walk like a robot. Right. Because right. of those 25 kilogram kettlebells on your feet where you need to slow down before you touch the floor. But also, of course, this is inherently very unsafe. You don't want to suddenly get hit by that. Right. So it started with that. Like we can't use these kind of systems if we want to build robots that are going to work among us. We need to build something that is very low energy compliant and safe. And that's why we use these tendon drives instead. And then we figured out no matter how good that is, if you have a million of them out there, it will fall on someone. Right. So you need to get the weight down. So you still need to be soft and compliant and low weight. If you do all of these things, you make a robot that is safe to the environment, safe to people, and safe to itself. So now I'm going to bring it back. So mm -hmm. that is the important part, right? So we've built a robot that is inherently built for reinforcement learning. It can fall over and get up again. The 1,000 times is the design requirements there, average wow. between failure. Wow. And that you just cannot do with a car. Now, having said that, I do think you can solve the car thing, some of it in simulation, because the, what you're trying to learn is not that much correlated to physics. A, a car is a pretty basic thing to right. simulate. And, and, now, and the, goal of car, the goal of a car, obviously, is not to interact with the world pretty much. Yes. Except for the road surface, you pretty much don't want to interact with anything. So not nearly yeah, as complex. Yeah. But yeah. you know, even with a car, you say like it's not supposed to interact with something. And that is very well said, because what simulators are incredibly bad at is interactions with the world. Right. Because that, like, how deep do you want to go, right? You can go all the one way down on the quantum level. It's so complicated. Right. But what simulators still really struggle with, even if you don't have to handle that, is what we call agent behavior. Mm -hmm. So how do people and all the cars and cats and whatever actually behave in your simulator? So that, that's yeah. also a very interesting uh, question here, if you want to simulate this. Right. And we do use simulation, actually. But then we use simulation not in the simulator. We use simulation in our own learned simulator. So we take all of our data and we build a world model that can predict the next states in the world. And then we can actually run, have the robot run experiments and learn in this system. But that right. is not simulated. It's from real data. Right. So it's a neural physics engine, effectively. You're using a neural network to learn physics. OK, that's really interesting. And and you even said that you're working on, I believe you said, like mood interaction with uh, the, emotional, the emotional qualities of humans. If you're going to have a robot at home, it needs to know whether the human is in a good mood or a bad mood or, or, or something like that, right, in order to effectively work with that person. Or so something as simple as just who is talking to you, mm, right? Okay. If, if you want to have a good product experience, you have to get rid of the keyword for all of these voice assistant systems. Right. And right. just like yeah. being able to look at you, knowing if you look at it and where the, which direction the audio is coming from and all these that are called the egocentric data, like data from the robot's point of view or from your point of view, if you were the one, um, that enables all of these things, right? So these things just kind of fall out of the environment that you deploy your Androids into. Uh, and this is not something you would get in a factory. Even though you would sometimes want to interact with people in a factory, actual interactions would be very sparse. Right. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, so you, I mean, in, in a sense, 
you're not just being, I think Herbert said like contrarian, which is a great term, but the contrarianness is honestly that you want a larger, more diverse data set. And you're just not going to get that in a factory. And because you've got a robot that's designed to be a cobot, that it's designed to be around mm -hmm. humans and very safe around them, you can deploy them into the field, into consumer uh, environments, like essentially now, right? They're, they're, they're very safe to be around. So you don't have to go into a factory first because they're able to go into the home. Oh, we lost you, John. Um, oh. So you're going to sell this because we just lost you, John. Let's keep going. Oh, sorry. I think I'm back, but <laughs> yeah, you're back. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So yeah, I was just saying like, you know, how you putting them into the home instead. So yes. Anyway. Yeah. And I, it's fun, right? I, I have one at home and uh, oh, it's, been, it's, been a, it's been a journey. It's been a journey. I want one. <laughs> when yeah. can we get one? And yeah. will you do uh, will you do a pilot program uh, beta testers we are already in the early infancy of uh <laughs> I know, it's like, i'm not sure to remember you guys um <laughs> but you know it's a steep hill to climb mm. and i'm in no way climb claiming that we've already solved this mm -hmm. um the first few weeks it was like having a new kit get up in the <laughs> middle of the night and wondering like what's that noise what's going on uh <laughs> and button. like yeah and you, I mean, it's like I, I tidied more after the robot than the robot tidied after me. Um, and, that, 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 and that says a lot because I have two kids throwing toys around. So we're good at right. making a mess. Um, but it's getting there and it's getting better and better. And it's incredibly interesting to observe how good humans are at manipulating in small spaces with large forces. So like... You shuffle between the like couch and living room table. And then you lean on the couch and stretch over to get something. Or you're like sitting on a knee and leaning underneath the couch to like get a toy or whatever. Like all of these things. Right? So you're you're bracing yourself on the cabinet while pulling the refrigerator door because it's stuck in vacuum. Or you're leaning your knees on the cabinets to stretch to get the glass in the cabinet. Like almost everything you do is multi-contact manipulation. And this is something that I want to just ramble a bit about because everyone is so obsessed with walking. Mm -hmm. And I can be put on tape saying, I don't care about walking. <laughs> walking is not useful. Manipulation is useful. You want to do useful labor. Now, sometimes you need to go somewhere to get there. But if the only thing we wanted to tackle was stairs, there's enough homes without stairs. The reason we have legs is because it makes us better manipulators. We can reconfigure our support zone. We can shuffle. We can step sideways. We can, we can sit down on a knee. We can use our knees to like brace against the cabinet, like I said, right? Mm -hmm. we, because we don't look at the robot as something that moves around and then manipulates with its hands. We look at the robot as something that uses his entire body to as efficiently as possible do a task. And yes, you, you can see this in a lot of our videos that like how you interact with the environment is not done only through the end effectors. We very often, for example, use our elbows to hold the door open if it's a spring loaded door while going through the door and all of these things. So this is why I really think that Neo is going to be so much more capable than Eve. Not because it can get around more easily, but because legs are so useful for manipulation. Wow. You know, you you really, I'm, I'm very impressed with the way you're answering the questions. You seem, you, 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 you have studied this, you've seen this, but can you just confirm, okay, you have a, a bot in your house and you are going to market this to consumers. And can you go ahead today and say to your Bob, uh, please go get me a beer and I'll go to the fridge, grab a beer and bring it to you. Or what kind of activities is it doing in your home right now? On a good day. The answer is on a good day. Okay. It's not reliable enough yet. It's a reliability uh, issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but on a good day, we can, we can do that. Even with some very complicated fridges. So mine has been pretty complicated, but uh, because it's a, it's a it's a big like double fridge uh, thing, so it's a very heavy door. But yes, on a good day it can do this. 
Um, now, we could roll this out today, oh. but that would have to be with Eve. And that mm -hmm. is not something I want to do from a safety perspective mm -hmm. because the robot is too heavy. So although Eve is very lightweight, <clears throat> it's still too heavy for these kind of use cases. Uh, so this is for Neo. And mm -hmm. we, can, we can run this in pilots with Eve because we can control the environment to a certain sense, make sure that people know how to behave around the robot. But safety is front and center when it comes to doing this at scale. And I think safety is also incredibly interesting as a general topic in robotics, yeah. because we can make the hardware passively safe, but you're only safe as long as you don't have any tools that might be dangerous. Mm -hmm. So you need to build what we're calling foundation models for robot safety, where you are doing these tiny risk assessments for every task that you plan on doing. And we do this all the time. We just don't think about it, right? Any task we do, we kind of do some forward simulation and think about the risks involved in what we're doing. And this is essential for you to be able to do useful things in a home. And in the beginning, we will not be handling dangerous objects for this specific reason. Mm -hmm. So if you think about, for example, what the robot would do in your home, tidying, cleaning, laundry, but not cooking. Although I would love for my robot to do cooking. Like that will come, there will be a time, but due to safety concerns, that is going to be a bit later when we have more data. So can can I ask you about because let's let's talk about the vertical integration and the price of the robot. Obviously, for a consumer level robot or a consumer purchased robot, the price is is much more important than it is for a, yeah. a, a factory or something, right? So is is the vertical integration? I mean, down to the point where you said you build the machines that make the copper coils and things like that, right? That it's very highly vertical integrated, vertically integrated. Does that really play heavily into the, the reduced cost or is it just the design of the robot to be an extremely inexpensive to, to build? Or is it a combination of those? Well, how, how are you going to get significantly cheaper than $25,000 a robot? I guess that's, that's the question. Mm -hmm. So, It is a combination, of course. A lot of it lies in making a system that is very, very capable, but still simple, like beauty through simplicity. Can you get rid of components? And a lot of what has happened in robotics up through the last 60 years has been kind of band-aid solutions mm. to existing problems instead of rethinking the approach. So you start with industrial robots, which are very good at being in a factory where everything is calibrated and you just want to move to a very specific position. You're not going to touch anything. You're just going to move. And then at some point you realize that, oh, I want to do, I want to be able to touch something. Okay, now, now you need a force sensor. I want to be able to touch something at a bit of a higher speed. Maybe I want to be able to wipe a surface. Now you need to be like compliant and adaptable. So now maybe you need some springs. And by taking a step back and designing the system from the bottom up, we avoid all of these components. Okay. And that, that creates a simpler, more manufacturable system. Uh, but of course, also a lot of it comes from just really spending the time to automate and build the machines that builds the machines for a lot of components that don't exist in volume because this space is so new. And this is something where, for example, I, I, we might have a small edge to Tesla on this right now because we've done it, but this is something that Tesla will catch up on very fast because this, they are way better at this than us. Right? So, um, but what I have a lot of faith in is the technical direction that we have chosen in the system itself, so that we are able to make a very simple system that is still more performant in that it's safer, lighter, 
stronger and faster while still being very manufacturable and simple. Cool. So can you can you talk a little bit, uh, get a little bit more into detail? I'm going to fill in for Scott here for a moment. But, you know, how how do your joints work if they're not traditional actuators? Uh, you know, because we don't get to see under the, 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 the nice soft compliant skin. So, you know, there's a little bit of a mystery as to how the, the joints are actually operating. Yeah, so I can't go into too much detail on that, okay. of That's course, okay. I uh, but I can, I, on a very high level, I can say that there are tendon-like structures getting pulled to move the joints. And this behaves very differently from like classical stiff robotic gears. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, they're just naturally compliant because, of course, anything that's a long, thin strand is going to have some flex to it. So, yeah, that's cool. Okay. Very interesting. Wow, Bernd. <clears throat> yes, you guys are just so unique. <clears throat> you know, like I, I started this off, that you started this quite early. You had an early partnership with OpenAI. You already have commercial partnerships for the security guards uh, with AD At the time, the company was called ADT Commercial now called ever on uh you of creating neo which is the humanoid bot and then you've got the big numbers i mean um i have not yet heard of another bot maybe i think tesla bot could say that they probably have 100 i don't know yet but you guys certainly are there and your goal is to mass produce low cost and and people always wondered you know look at eve um you know it looks this <laughs> cuddly face it doesn't look like it looks like yeah like it looks like it's just costume but there's a reason it's because you are purposely trying to use low cost but also if your purpose is consumer you're not you're just probably going to pick up lower weight things to be able to do useful work within the home you're going to go consumer first which again i have not heard anybody say that they're going to do that first that's a shocker to me because i've been having this argument and debate with a bunch of people and i said there's no way it's going to appear in the homes for years it's all industrial <laughs> you, you just ah, i'm wrong <laughs> because you proved me wrong uh you're going to do a um you're going to do a beta program you're already testing this out at your home and you believe that mass numbers of volumes of uh, bots in the home it's going to create that and then you're not you're not teaching it for specific tasks it's this you call it common sense where this emergent behavior where it understands when you say clean up the house it'll know what to do instead of just saying this task that task and that task um did i did i miss anything no i <laughs> think says, it's pretty it sorry i just want to emphasize that like the droid is very capable of being strong so even though we're going okay. to home, it's uh like I said initially, like if we go in kilos instead of this time, Neo can actually squat or deadlift 70 kilos. Wow. So it's, even though it just weighs 30. So it's very, very capable. pounds. Yeah. 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 So it's very, very, very capable. Um, now, you don't generally do that that much in a home when doing tidying or whatever. But a surprising number of tasks are very heavy. Like, you know, kids often struggle with opening the refrigerator if it's stuck mm -hmm. in vacuum. Yeah. So actually, we did some measurements on this initially, and like you're pulling with like between 20 and 30 kilograms of force to open a mm -hmm. fridge if it's stuck in vacuum. So with one hand, that's pretty heavy. So you need to be pretty strong to be fully capable. Wow. I did not know that. Okay, so it's very capable. So it's not this thing, but your design is very different than others. And uh, maybe that's going to really differentiate your approach is different than others. <laughs> so we need to, I need to keep emphasizing to people that you guys, you guys are first commercial, you were talking hundreds of bots, and you've really studied this and you want to go consumer first. This is all unique and early partnership with OpenAI. Uh, and and the the fun part about this is that your partnership with OpenAI this was like before ChatGPT came out. Right. It's like as if you guys knew, or at least <laughs> like knew that this was going to happen by now, right? I mean, like, is it is the time frame coming along with what you anticipated, or is it a lot later than you thought, or is it a lot earlier than you thought? It's a couple of years later. So like when when I started this nine years ago. Mm -hmm. I was really looking deeply at the problem, like what is solvable? And then actually the entire thing started for me with like, I, I was designing, I was designing motors 
We're also like, okay, if you if you're going to create something that's safe, safe, scalable with respect to manufacturing, all these things, and go for a different system that don't require the gears. I kind of did the napkin math and like, oh, we need something that's three times more powerful torque to weight than anything that exists. So it's like, okay, can that be done? And it proves it can. So we, we were way past that at this point. Uh, so we have a lot of IP in the motor space. But that was basically because I saw that, okay, I think we can do the biomechanics. We can get the biomechanics right. We can build the system. We don't know how to solve the AI yet. It's too early. Yeah. So let's really yeah. position ourselves so that when the time becomes right, mm. we can actually solve the AI. This was back in 2015, right? Yeah. It's all the way in the beginning of like the first, there weren't even, weren't even transformers at this point, but there, there were language models. Yeah. Um, and then I actually thought around like GPT-1, GPT-2, I was like, okay, we're, we're going to solve this. But it took a bit longer. It took a bit longer. Um, the language model space has evolved very, very fast. And robotics is probably lagging like a couple of years behind. I thought it, and that was a bit of a surprise to me. But again, I think it's, it is mainly a function of like, we haven't had the data uh, because we don't have the scale. And um, if, if I'm right and like it's a couple of years behind, then we're, quickly coming up on the chat GPT moment of robotics, right? So uh, okay. and I, I might also be, I like the word contrarian too. And I actually often, when I talk to people about this, I do say we are the contrarian bet. So <laughs> we might also be completely wrong. That, that remains to be seen. But I, you, I do have yeah. a very high conviction that this will sca it scale the way it seems to do. Mm -hmm. And as long as it scales the way it seems to do, then I'm very confident that this is the right bet. Okay, can you just give me step by step what's going to happen now? This is April 2024. <laughs> what's going to happen by then this year? Uh, when you use, is that Eve is 2025, Neil's 2025, scale to each month or each quarter, what's going to be happening for your company? So 2025 is going to be all about getting the consumer use case right. So there's a lot of details there which has nothing to do with robotics. Like for example, privacy. Mm -hmm. So I, I deeply care about privacy. We want to be big sister, not big brother here, if you're familiar with the terminology, right? Okay. Because mm -hmm. we do need your data for the robot to be able to learn how to do things in your home. And it's also a bit personalized, right? Everyone's homes is different. But we do want you to feel empowered and be in control of your data. And this really needs to be tested out at scale. Because at, at the scale we're operating now, we're all kind of blunted because we work with this. So we need to get this out to real customers that like, how, how do they feel and how do you, how do you handle privacy? We have a lot of good ideas on how to do this and how to create these kind of like virtual fences, both with respect to time and space, et cetera, and like give you control, but all of this needs to be mapped out. And I think that that's going to be a big, big part of the next year for us. Scaling manufacturing, that's always painful. Uh, we've scaled manufacturing for EVE, but that we're still going to increase it by an order of magnitude roughly. So we have a clear path on how to do it because it's not multiple orders of magnitude, but it's still going to be very hard. Um, and then making sure we have the right data. I mean, that's, that's all it is, right? If you want your AI to work very well, you need the right data and building out that data engine and ensuring that basically we have the biggest physical data flywheel ever, ever created. And this is incredibly powerful because if you think about how this works, when a robot does a task and it doesn't know how to do it, so it fails on the task. And then a human operator takes over and completes the task. Then your task got done, and the robot now knows how to do the task correctly. And this kind of data is often actually more valuable than just the data on doing the task, because mm -hmm. this data tells you if you're failing at the task, 
how do you recover? Mm -hmm. And that is where a lot of our common sense comes from. Seeing like when we're out of distribution, how do we get back onto distribution? I, I, can I jump in on that just really quick? Uh, it, that was one of the most interesting things that you said was I heard the, the sort of graceful failure that that anything that has to interact with reality is going to of necessity and doing any kind of complex task is going to fail eventually at that task. And so how how do you deal with that? Like, do you do you just allow the bot to to I, I don't I, I guess I'm trying to figure out how do you deal with out of distribution data when you're doing training or maybe you can't talk about that too specifically but at least on a high level you know what do you throw it into a simulator and allow it to fail a million times in the simulator where it can do that very rapidly or you know how how, that, how do you work with that uh, generally we let it fail in the real world that's why you have okay. to build proper hardware that doesn't fail right uh because, because your robot will be failing all the time especially in okay. the beginning now okay. for a lot of tasks we get pretty good reliability so it doesn't fail that often Right. But when it fails, you need to teach it how to recover. Okay. And like maybe the simple canonical task would be you're carrying something and you drop it on the floor. So right. now you need to pick it up again. Right. Um, and maybe the most interesting would be opening a door. Okay. Where you try to open a door, you miss the handle. So now you slam your hand into the okay. <laughs> into the door. Then you try to go through the door, but the door isn't open. So you smash your head into the door and then you try to figure out what happened. Uh, okay. And then it's very important that you don't need to build a new robot and that you don't right. need to build a new hand. And then you don't like that, that, that all of your system actually is soft compliant and safe yeah. with respect to yeah. itself, with respect to your door, because you don't want yeah. your door to be full of bruises and, yeah. and with respect to people. That's great. So, so really, like the fact that you built this to be safe and compliant from the get go allows you to yeah. test in the real world far more frequently than many robotics uh, companies yeah, are able it won't to cost do. Them this much. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah, That's and I mean, cool. most of our droids have like eight plus hours of runtime doing tasks every day. Okay. And okay, I was going to ask you that eight hours are... of runtime. The, wow. Before battery to recharge required, so that's that's that that's completely different than others. Others are saying no, no, four the hours. The battery is charging, um, okay. so it depends okay. on the task we're doing. But one of the very valuable lessons we actually learned when we deployed mm -hmm. was that our customers didn't care at all about battery life. Mm -hmm. They cared about operational time. So gotcha. They care about how fast do you charge. Because if right. you say like, I can work for one hour and then I need like a five minute break. Oh, that's great. I can that's work right. for six hours and then I need like a four hour break. Not great. Mm -hmm. uh, like, so um, it's all about charge speeds. So we optimize way more for mm -hmm. charge speed than we actually do for uh, runtime. Gotcha. And this is and also very that, to drive down the speed of the system. Okay. And Eve also, I noticed, can plug herself in, right? She can just yeah. rant. Yeah. So, I mean, that's good too. So you don't have to have a human interact with it every time. Yeah, right there. <laughs> every time she wants to charge up or something, you don't have to have a human go and charge her, like plug her in. So that's very helpful under those circumstances. Yeah. It is. So, okay. and I think, yeah. For th things we haven't really talked about, I think it, it, it's also very interesting to look at what are, what, what are the impacts of these kind of droids on society. And when, when all of our, I like to say like our digital systems become physical, because so much has happened in the digital space when it comes to automation and AI. Mm -hmm. And we can trace this all the way back to way before AI, right? Just in general, uh, taking paper and automating it with online forms, databases, office work, all of these things has gone through a, like a revolution way before AI. And now it's going through another revolution uh, due, due to these large transformers. But if you walk into a home today and you ignore all of the flat TVs and like other screens on your wall, it would be very hard to tell it apart from a home in 1970. 
mm-hmm. except for the colors on the walls maybe but like appliance wise mm-hmm. mm-hmm. and it is baffling how little has happened with respect to productivity increase in our physical realm it's all in the digital one mm-hmm. we've moved labor around like there's good maps on this where you can see like how labor has moved around the globe due to cost but we haven't actually increased productivity that much we've mainly moved labor around and mm-hmm. this is not true in the digital space this is true only for the physical one and i think the impact that we can have here is going to be so incredible because ultimately as a society we are labor constrained and if you take that to the limit you could even say sustainability for example is an a lack of sustainability is an artifact of lack of labor if you have abundance of labor by definition you have sustainability because there is no more any reasons to cut corners to save cost and i think it's a problem that's really worth solving because so many people are doing great work in trying to capture or create energy in a more efficient manner where there is like fusion fission solar wind and as a species we've gotten pretty good at harvesting energy but we haven't gotten so good yet when it comes to taking that energy and turning it into products and services and in the end that is what we are as a modern civilization we capture energy and turn it into products and services and that happens mostly physically not in the digital realm and i'm super excited that we are living in a time where we get to be part of that transformative shift and then we have the discussion of will this happen in 2026 or in 2036 but it will happen and it is going to have an enormous impact on our productivity and our ability to enjoy our life and ensure that everyone has what they need thank you so much Bert. that uh you know yeah it's it's not just about you know work and the labor it's it's like you just explained it very nicely eloquently appreciate that you know again you guys are a company to watch uh, you approach things very differently it explained a lot of what your how your bot looks what your goals are um and i think that you're somebody that you know anybody who's interested in humanoid robots needs to be following very closely yeah. and uh, your background in robotics um, but clearly, you know, you have both the strategy, but also, you know, all the little details, even like, you know, when your elbow hits <laughs> the cupboard, that's the kind of things you guys have learned that few have probably explored yet. So you seem to be ahead in many ways. Thank you for spending your time with us. I appreciate this, Bernd. Uh, you know, you guys are at, uh, one X technologies, right? One X, uh, what's your website? Is it one X robotics? One X dot tech. One X dot tech. Yeah. And then you can be found on X at Bernd Bornich. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernd. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.